Welcome to the Wealthy Speaker Podcast, brought to you by the Wealthy Speaker School. This is the podcast dedicated to people who want to speak more as a way to build their income and grow their business. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us at the Wealthy Speaker Podcast today. Um, I'm happy that you're here. I'm your host, Jane Atkinson, and we're going to dive into some humor ideas. There is no better form of marketing than a great speech, and a big part of that is really allowing people to roll along and have uh, some moments where they just relax through humor. Our guest expert is Rick Roberts. Welcome, Rick. Hey, thanks for having me on today. Rick is out of Nashville, and I was just asking him how he got his start in the speaking industry. Tell our audience how you got going. Well, initially, I started out as a stand-up comic and did that in the comedy clubs nonstop through all the 90s and you know, got to work with all the comics that turned into sitcom stars and all that kind of stuff. So it was a ton of fun. And in 98, there was this big thing where the economy kind of crashed. And on top of that, Bank of America got singled out for spending way too much for a corporate event. I don't know if you remember that, but they had like sure do. <laughs> na- naked statues holding grapes and all this stuff, millions of dollars. <laughs> and I was hired to do a, you know, my comedy for a group, an association event down in Mississippi. And the guy called me up and said, you know what? We cannot have a comedian. They're going to kill us if we say comedian. We in trouble. That's right. He goes, <laughs> He goes, but if you could not be funny for an hour, we can still pay you. <laughs> I said, buddy, I, I could be not funny for 24 hours. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he goes, well, if, if you could have a point and be funny while you're delivering it, we're all in. He goes, I looked at your website. I don't see anything like that, but could you come up with a program like that? Yeah. And it was in the back of my head for several years to do a program called the Mayberry Method because I'm a big Andy Griffith Show fan. Okay. And I thought, well, I'll discuss this with this event planner. I said, hey, I've got this idea. It's all about eliminating distractions and getting back to basics so you can serve your customers and clients. And it's, it's revolves around the Andy Griffith Show, but there'll be plenty of comedy in it, but there'll definitely be some takeaways for your group. Problem is, I've never delivered this to any group before. <laughs> so no you pressure. need me to, that's right. You need me to be serious. I need to keep the, keep the job. So let's try it. If it doesn't work out, don't pay me anything. Uh, but if it works out, you know, we'll just go with what we had on the contract. So he kind of gave me the green light to step into the speaking world, something that I had in the back of my mind for a while, but really didn't have the, you know, the one pivotal moment where you had to do it. So because there was no deadline, I had never stepped across that threshold, mm-hmm. did that program. And at the end of it, I got booked for three more speaking engagements before I even got to the back of the room. Wow. That's a sign of a great show. It was a sign for sure. And the number one comment I had from all of the people that hired me was finally a speaker that can keep us engaged and laughing while they deliver the message. Mm. And this was like at 8 a.m. to 9 o'clock in the morning. So <laughs> not the ideal comedy hours for a guy that used to be in comedy clubs and stuff, but it, yeah. a, a light bulb went off. And I'm like, yes, if you can deliver the message and be funny, you'll get hired again and people will spread the word about you. So I know for a fact that I'll share some tips today that can help all the speakers out there. But that was my initial, you know, speech and then I uh, have a friend that was in the NSA, uh, Damian Mason, who mm-hmm. used to be a Bill Clinton impersonator, did humor, but then he oh, evolved yeah. into an ag speaker and innovation. And he said, come to one of these meetings and see if you like it. And that's where I kind of found my second tribe of speakers and have learned from a bunch of them over the years. Awesome. I remember Damian. Um, do you know George Campbell? I know of him, don't know Joe, him too well. Joe Malarkey. Well, I remember being around uh, when George first discovered the speaking, quote unquote, speaking business. And he could not believe the differences between speaking and comedy. Just for the education of our listeners, talk about what the difference is in terms of getting paid and you know how many shows you have to do and you know <laughs> yeah. it's it's a grind the comedy circuit is a grind talk about that and getting booked i mean if sure. you know how to get booked there you're probably going to have the same kind of chops for speaking right and i'll, I'll just give you some numbers up front to kind of give you an idea of the, of the difference sure. that that the two things get from the respect angle from people that are hiring you so if you're working a comedy club, 
And it can take years before you even get to the point to do a comedy club of open mics and driving hundreds of miles to do five minutes. Once you get in and you're able to MC for 15 minutes and do that throughout a week, you might get paid as much as $300 to $350. Ooh. So when you're 19 <laughs> and 20 and 21, that sounds pretty good. You know, it yeah. keeps you out of the, the fast food jobs or whatever. When you, when you start featuring and you're doing 30 minutes in the club, that money might double. So you might be at a place all week and make a whopping 600 maybe $650. All right. No That's travel awesome. compensated, none of that. Yeah. Yeah. So all of your travel costs and everything are on your own shoulder until what level? Is there a point where people mm -hmm. start paying you to travel to them? Yeah. So once you start headlining and there's kind of two degrees of headlining, a, a headliner can cover an hour of a comedy show mm -hmm. and they're funnier than the first two comics that were on the show. So the show builds and right. you, just, it, you just leave them laughing hard and, once you can do that, you get the top dollar for the comedy club. But once you can prove that you can do that and sell tickets, people know you and come out to see you specifically. Bums in seats. Yeah, that's right. I always say there's two kinds of bits, comedy bits and butts in the seats. Exactly. <laughs> so once you can do that, then you have the, the leverage on the comedy club. But until okay. then, you need them to do your job. All right. With speaking, you start with the need. What is I, What can I do to serve a client? Because, I mean, there's, there's hundreds of options for comedians and entertainers and jugglers. If they just want that, you still have to go through the steps that every other speaker does to differentiate yourself. Mm -hmm. But the key is finding how do I serve them and deliver my comedy at the same time. And I got kind of lucky to where the guy in Mississippi basically said, here's what I need you to do. Yeah. Here is the need. Yeah. <laughs> Don't be funny the whole time. <laughs> and then deliver a, a positive message that we can take home and apply. That was a huge shift in the industry when uh, they, they needed to prove to their shareholders that they weren't wasting a lot of money with these big events. And so the pendulum has swung probably all the way back again, but that never really changed back to the old ways. Mm -hmm. They People still need ROI. So I thought that was a good thing that had happened to the industry because there was a lot of being, there was a lot of fluff being paid for and really we needed to, you know, tighten up our boots. Absolutely. Okay. So I laughed at 300 to $350, but please <laughs> know that I respect anyone who can trade them speaking or making people laugh for any money at all. I think it's just huge that we get the privilege of doing this in our industry, whether you make 300, 3000 or 30,000. Right. Uh, I just want you to know that, uh, respect, respect. Okay. But there is a big difference in the industry. The, this, yeah. the person who I interviewed on the podcast right before you was sitting at 30K. Right. <laughs> so that's why it's kind of funny. Um, all right. So let's talk about, uh, you know, why somebody might want to amp up their humor in their presentations. Sure. Well, first off, I think humor in general does a few things that, that helps your speech uh, really be absorbed by the audience. One, a little bit of humor shows that you're human, that you're not just a robot up there with a can of program, just delivering bullet point after bullet point after PowerPoint slide after PowerPoint slide. <laughs> and we've, we, we've all sat in those meetings before, sometimes before we go on to speak and we see somebody that's just boring the audience to tears. You see so many phones out and people checking their WhatsApp or their Facebook page. And it's like, because you're not engaging. Yeah. You don't have to be funny the entire 60 minutes or 90 minutes. The, the key for a speaker who's trying to implement comedy is to sprinkle it in there. And that keeps the audience kind of waiting for it. So when they're waiting for it, it's like a dog. Not to, <laughs> not to compare an audience to a dog. Right. <laughs> but, but you reward behavior, right? So if people are waiting for it and then all of a sudden when they least expect it, you deliver a line that makes them laugh. The endorphins fire in our brains and we're, we're rewarded that way. And our body physically craves that again, mm -hmm. you know, within, as quickly as we can get that again. And the more we get that in a speech, the more we crave it and reward it as an audience. So when we build that in from the start, or even if you've got a program now and you're going to want to insert humor in there, all of a sudden you'll notice people leaning in, the phones go back in their purses and pockets and people are engaged with the content. Right. So it's, it's super important. It's valuable. It changes their physiological demeanor 
sitting there in the audience if yeah. they're getting those endorphins delivered. It changes the energy in the room, right? I mean, the whole room, that first laugh happens, all the shoulders relax some, and the whole energy in the room uh, changes. So let's talk about the timing of that. Do you need to do it in the first 30 seconds? Like how, talk about how you might space it out throughout the presentation. Sure. You know, for anybody that hasn't tried humor yet or they've tried it and it hasn't worked, it can be a little, you know, just a little bit uh, daunting to try to implement it. So I'll give you a few ways that you can do it without people even knowing you're trying to do it mm -hmm. so that if it fails, they're not associating anything back to you. It's just another part of your speech. So what I like to do when I speak is to have a part of my introduction that gets a laugh. And the great thing about this is I'm not even on stage yet. And if it right. doesn't work or doesn't get a big laugh, it's, it's, they're not looking at me at all yet. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? They can blame the introducer. <laughs> right. And you could, you could even, like, for example, I've got, I'm part of a group of comedians that are in the Guinness Book of World Records for the longest comedy show. It went on for eight and a half days. Oh, my goodness. So, exactly. When people hear that, they're like, what? And then people <laughs> in the back of their head are like, this guy's going to talk forever. <laughs> you know? <laughs> So in the introduction, I'll have, I'll have two things before that. We'll get to the rules of comedy in a second. Yeah, but there's yeah. a thing called the rule of threes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A statement, a statement, a misdirection. So Rick Roberts is out of Nashville, Tennessee. You may have seen him on uh, Drive Our Comedy Special or Pure Flix Comedy All-Stars. And he's in the Guinness Book World Records for the longest running comedy show, which went on for eight and a half days. And I always tell the presenter, the introducer to pause there, let him soak that in and go, and if you don't laugh early, he's going to try to break that record today. <laughs> That's a good one. Right? And really so the good. MC gets a laugh. He feels good or she feels good for getting a yeah. laugh because we just like that. And right. the audience loosens up. And then I can walk in and talk about that experience right out of the gate because they're going to have questions like, how did, did you do it all by yourself or how many comedians were in it? Yeah. And I can have a couple of jokes about that. I love that. Now, do you want to just kind of sit on the rule of threes a little bit, maybe expand on that? Because I don't know that everybody knows. How, well, we've certainly over here at the Wealthy Speaker School talked a lot about how the rule of three works just in general, threes mm -hmm. work. But comedy has some very specific rules of threes that, do you tell more about that? Sure. So, Probably the, the earliest example of a rule of threes are like all those jokes that we hear our, our uncles and our grandfathers tell, like a priest, a rabbi, and a pastor <laughs> walking to a bar. Right, right, right. right. So you've got three people. Right. The first person does something that you would expect them to do. Right. The second one does something you expect them to do. And the third person right. does something crazy. Yeah. And even though we know that's the formula, it's that setup of two times we're going down a logical path mentally and sometimes visually. And the third one is such a curveball, we trip over because we're, we're trying to think ahead of what right. that third person is going to do, and they do something different. Nice. So, so the rule of three is, is kind of boiled down that in, as far as structure. I call it truth, truth, twist. Yes. That's an easy way to remember it. So it's two true things or factual or logical and then something they don't expect. Right. And, and that third one can be as exaggerated as you want it to be. Uh, the more contrast you have between – the logical and the illogical, the bigger the laugh will be. Okay. And so now let's just go just a little bit down the rabbit hole of creative nonfiction. <laughs> what would you say is your take on having that third thing be something that is just a flat out lie, but you're doing it for the joke and that's okay because that's what you're doing it for. Right. So, and it's interesting because there's, there's jokes I have, and it, again, it's all about knowing your audience. Mm -hmm. So not every joke is going to work with every audience. Right. So you know, opening jokes and introductions, you want to write several of those for those different kinds of groups. Kind of a, a lighthearted one, a more in-your-face one, and maybe a way over the top one. Okay. So for example, if I do, and I don't do too many uh, speaking engagements that are after 9.30 or 10 p.m., but I do some of them, mm -hmm. and usually those groups have enjoyed the free bar yeah. or something like that. And then they come <laughs> into the comedy room. So I'll have a, here's an example of a, a rule of three joke that I'll usually only do for that kind of later group is uh, all right. uh, I'm 50. I've got two kids. Uh, when I had my first kid, I took all the money I used to spend on alcohol and put it in their college fund. And that kid is looking great. <laughs> when I had my second kid, I quit smoking and put all that money in their college fund. They're going to be all right. If I have another kid, I have to give up heroin. 
<laughs> right. So that's that's the extreme example of, right. and they would look at me and know that I wouldn't be that kind of right. person that would do it. So that's right. That's the contrast of a really nice guy talking about setting up his kid's life for college. Right. How sweet is that? You yeah. know, and then girl, <laughs> that's right. Okay, that's, I like that. That's probably the most extreme example I can give you between the two. Okay. Uh, but you can use again that rule of threes in your introduction to get a laugh. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of my f- I love what I, you did there. Yeah, my favorite uh, comedian that I used to work with, her name is Christine Stedman. She's out of St. Louis. Uh, at, the t- at the time, she was probably in her late 40s, kind of a, a tough, fiery kind of woman, you know? Yeah. And she would, in her introduction, say, our next comedian has won, you know, whatever contest. She's from right here in St. Louis, and she used to work at Hooters. Give it up for Christine Stedman. <laughs> and she would kind of barrel roll out on the stage, you know? And she doesn't look like anybody you'd picture working at Hooters. That's funny. And she goes, oh, forget you guys. I was the cook. You know? <laughs> <laughs> nice. I like so it. She, she set an expectation based on our previous assumptions. Right. And then she shattered it when she hit the stage. So that's, that's a, a good example of, yeah, the, the MC doing most of the work for her. And then she's just addressing what you're thinking in your mind. And, you know, anybody who has something that people might be thinking in their mind for yes. you to address the elephant in the room like head on is so super funny, don't you think? Like, let's say uh, you're a little bit overweight and you're there talking about your life as an Olympic gymnast or something like that. And, you know, I know what right. you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. You know, look at this body, Olympic gymnast. Yeah. I got it. Huh? You know, like if you were just joking about that, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's fun to do. And, you know, for that example right there, the, the person go, I was a spotter, you know, or I was, I was the rep. You know, I was the good. mat. <laughs> I was the mat. <laughs> that's really good. You're quick. Well, you know, it's just my skill set is honed towards this, but I love, you know, connecting through humor. But, yeah, having those, like you say, elephant in the room. What I say, there's there's two things you can connect with uh, in that arena, and it's it falls under the category of self-deprecating humor. Making yeah. fun of ourselves so that nobody else can, or making fun of ourselves first so we can make fun of others. There's yeah. kind of two ways you can do it. Right. But within that, there's two ways to it to come on stage with that self-deprecating. One is the physical appearance. You know, you might be looking somebody that's seven foot tall, and you know they could come on stage and say, you know, they hired me as a speaker, but really they just wanted me here so I could change the light bulbs in the room without getting a ladder or something like that. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so we, some of us have a very obvious physical thing, a lot of tattoos, you know, some speakers go for that. So that's just like right. you know, bright suits or bright hair or whatever it might be. Yeah, yeah. The other thing though, that I think we tap in more and it's more surprising is, so that's ca- what I call external, something on the physical side. Mm-hmm. Internal is what we are inside in our hearts and our minds and our experiences. And those the audience wouldn't know or expect unless we told them. Right. So if you're trying to... Uh, uh, you know, connect with an audience. Like if I'm speaking to a group that's 50 and up, for example, mm-hmm. uh, one of my first jokes would be, uh, man, I, I enjoyed the meal tonight, but I had to watch what I was eating because I've got high cholesterol. And they wouldn't know that unless I told them. Right. And then I would exaggerate and say, yeah, my doctor said my cholesterol level is 425. <laughs> and so that builds a little tension, like 400. And people go, oh. And I go, yes, yeah, the highest in my county. So now I get to go to regionals in a couple of weekends. <laughs> that's good. But that's an internal thing, you know, and it might be that you just recently got divorced and you want to make fun of that, or maybe you got a promotion. You want to show that you're, you don't think you're all that because you got the promotion. Now I'm driving a, an Accord instead of a Hyundai or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's ways to, yeah, there's ways to have fun with that. And just, and really it all comes down to contrast and misdirection. Yeah. I love it. And I especially love self-deprecating humor And I really love it when people point out the obvious elephant in the room that you don't know if they're going to talk about it or not, you know, uh, and that's wonderful. And I've got, I want to share one other one with you because I was just thinking, so it's one thing you can do to address it and say what they're thinking. Mm -hmm. It's also even better when you address it and say what they're not thinking. Oh, interesting. Okay. So I'll give you an example. One of my favorite opening lines, uh, from a comedian named Brett Leake. And okay. if you want to look him up, it's L-E-A-K-E. Brilliant okay. comedian. So when he comes on stage, he has MS. 
and he's he literally has to have somebody almost carry him to the stage and put him on a stool and he grabs mm-hmm. the microphone and talks. So everybody in the room is like, well, what's going to happen here? Yeah. And, and he goes something to the effect of, I just want to get this out of the way right up front. I have a disability. It's a degree in philosophy. <laughs> but let's, let's not that hold us back for this next hour. Let's have <laughs> Misdirect. I like that. It's so much fun. That's and people, so good. That's all he has to say about his disability the entire time. He just addresses it by not addressing it. Yeah. But in a fun way. That's really good. I love it. Okay. Um, I'm a really big fan of uh, Brian Reagan's humor yes. because it is so clean. It's, and it takes you down lots of different roads. But okay. But let's say we're not a comedian. And in fact, we're like a little bit shy. Maybe uh, we don't think we're very funny. Like what does the person do to try to in- start incorporating humor who might fall into those categories? Yeah, I, th- I think there's a couple of ways you can do it without putting too much pressure on yourself. Okay. And if you're a speaker, you have a few things at your disposal that most comedians don't have that you can take advantage of. Mm-hmm. One is the big screens they have in the room that people typically have if they got a keynote. Even if you're not heavily reliant on PowerPoint, most speakers at least have a slide with their name and their Twitter handle or something. So if you have that available, use some visuals to illustrate key points in your program. And what I like to do, especially with visuals, is or any kind of humor for that fact in the program is to anchor it before and after a key takeaway point. So if you have a really, you know, and most speakers shouldn't have more than three key takeaways or else it becomes just too much to absorb and none of it gets done. Right. We love threes. That's right. (laughs) So as you're building up to your, your first takeaway, having a humorous example from your own personal life or something that's happened recently in the news or something that illustrates that, or, you know, it, you can search Google Images and look for stock images or royalty-free images that help drive your point home. Okay. If you, if you don't find either of those, you could search quotes from comedians on certain topics. Okay. Any, any topic that you're going to talk about, communication, marriage, uh, change, all these different topics that we hear all the time, mm-hmm. there's going to be comedians that have a joke about it. Now, so what you could do is quote that comedian with a slide, have their you know, picture or their name and the quote. So you're not taking credit for it. Right. But you're introducing humor into your program. And that's probably the easiest on ramping as far as adding some simple humor like that. That's good. Low hanging fruit. What about a cartoon visual? Yeah. Cartoons, especially if you're in the, the speaking industry in, in front of the typical setup companies, employees, if you go to Dilbert, search <laughs> Dilbert, he's he probably everything. In the <laughs> There's a cartoon for every occasion. Uh, Every single work. one. <laughs> That's so great. do the same thing. You know, you may, and I don't know how it works with cartoons. I don't use any of mine. So you may need to ask permission to use it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but e- even with or without, you, you always want to credit the person. You know, it's obvious with Dilbert because the, the author's name is right there. But if you're right. crediting a comedian, make sure you give him credit as well. I love it. I love it. Okay. Now, what about mining our own lives for humor and mining the workplaces that we've been in and what have you? What, what are some techniques for always being on the hunt? Yeah. So a couple of things you can do. You have a great advantage when you're speaking to a group to ask them in your program, hey, I love to hear personal examples of anything I've been talking about so I can share them with future audiences. If something connected with, here with you today and you have a personal story that you think is kind of funny you want to share with me, mm-hmm. I'm, in the, I'm in the hallway until I hear all of them. I'd love right. to hear them. Love and it. I've, I've done that before with different groups. And sometimes 90% of the time it's a story you can't use for various reasons. <laughs> 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 you know. But once in a while somebody gives you just a gem and I just say, do you mind if I put that in my program and, and give you credit for telling me? And they're like, oh, that'd be great because yeah. you know, when you were talking, that's the first thing. that. So they connected with you with their own humor when you were delivering a serious point, they're giving you the gift. So you can, you can crowdsource. Beautiful. So that's a great way. Yeah. But you can definitely go back and mine your, your previous experiences, you know, especially if you worked in that industry that you're speaking to. And, and a lot of times speakers are, they, they left the hospitality industry. Now they talk about customer service or what have you. Right. And go back and think about times where, and here, here's where I think is a, an important way to get into finding stories that matter. Think of times where you said something or did something that made you think maybe my job is on the line for doing that. 
where you thought you might get fired because those are high stakes events in our lives. Right. And even if it wasn't hilarious at the time with retrospect and if, with being in a different place now, we can look back and maybe have some humor and some thoughts about here's what I wanted to say. One, two things that are logical, but here's what I actually said. Third, something completely illogical that put me in that position. Right. I love it. And on top of that, just think of any time day to day where your mood changes drastically, <laughs> right? Cause those are, those are emotions and we all connect through emotions. So we may not have worked at a certain place before or have the expertise that you do, mm-hmm. but we all feel anger, uh, mistrust, disappointment, elation, and we can connect with our audiences, those emotions as well. So what happened today that changed your mood? Is there something there we can dig into for comedy? Was that overreacting or underreacting or was somebody else, you know, putting something on me I didn't deserve? I love People it. can definitely connect to that. I love it. And if I'm a customer service speaker, every time I'm out in the world being served in some way, I'm mining for opportunities to, to find some humor and Absolutely. things that are happening all the way around me. And, and that goes for everything. Okay. So I want to put you on the spot for something, Rick. Okay. I would like to know what some of the rules of comedy are, but I would like to know one of them from Barney Fife. Ah, from Barney <laughs> Fife, huh? <laughs> I'm totally putting you on the spot here. I well, apologize. <laughs> here's one thing you can do. If you got an impression, make sure you use it in your program. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. Well, well you know, what? from watching uh, Don Knotts on everything he's ever recorded. I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of him as well as the Andy Griffith show. Yeah. What he did to connect with people, and he never said it out loud, but he pretended to be the smartest person in the room <laughs> and had the least amount of skills. <laughs> that's funny. I never thought about it like that. And that's contrast again. He thought he was, he was the mastermind and he was the guy who couldn't think outside the small box. Yeah. You know? So as speakers, you can think about, you know, what, what do you know and what do you not know, right? And so even if we go back to quoting comedians or, or quoting cartoons, we could quote experts. Mm-hmm. And we could, you could put a quote on the screen and then interpret it in a way that has nothing to do with what's actually on the screen. <laughs> and, and, That's funny. You know what I mean? Yes. So like, if the, I don't know, give me a quote and we'll see if we can work one out. But what's, um, the, what's the thing? You know, what about something about... Um, who are you not to be your greatest self? Some, you know, the Marianne Williamson quote. I yeah, yeah. Really, so yeah. You could have it on the screen. Mm-hmm. So who are you not to be your greatest self? And you could say, um, so what this is saying here is that you're the best person in the world. You're the <laughs> ass- So who are you not to be your best self? You'd be somebody else. You wouldn't be you. <laughs> So always be your best self and show it and shove it in people's faces. Right. <laughs> shove it in right. people's faces. <laughs> so the audience should get the, the sarcasm there and, That's and like funny. a little bit. That's yeah. funny. I really love sarcasm. And uh, I just think um, our friend uh, George Campbell, who play, used to do, I don't think he does it anymore, uh, George Malar- uh, wait, Joe Malarkey, mm-hmm. uh, the world's worst motivational speaker. He right. would have done something like that and then taken it down and down and down and down many, many levels because uh, being the world's worst motivational speaker had a lot of angles to it. <laughs> Not to oh, be yeah. the best. Uh, yeah. He had a lot of fodder there. So when you come into the room uh, for your presentation – you do something funny just to kind of get things started in character, correct? Yeah. So if I'm doing the Mayberry program, and I've, I've got four programs, this, the Mayberry method is my favorite one just because I get to put on the, the Andy Griffith, you know, cop uniform and, and be Barney Fife. So one thing I noticed that we're lacking in a lot of uh, speakers is not a very good, strong intro, not, nothing super interesting up front and not a strong close. Okay. As a comedian, I know those are the two most important things for an audience to identify with because as soon as you, even as a comic or a speaker, people are judging you off stage before you even take the microphone or the podium. They're looking at how you handle yourself in the corner before you're being introduced. If you're checking your watch and you're looking disinterested or checking your phone, they notice those things. Right. So when I wanted to put together my speech, I'm like, I'm going to have fun with this and make a big intro and a big exit. So what I do for the intro is I have... Uh, the company give me three or four names of people in the room yeah. 
that I can single out and bring to the front of the room to issue a ticket to. <laughs> right. And so I'll, I'll have them introduce the speaker, you know, which is me and I'll have them say, you know, this guy comes all the way from North Carolina, drove a long way to be here. And right at that point, I blow my whistle, throw the door open and kind of, you know, stumble through it like Barney Fife would. Yeah. And I'm like, Hey, wait a second. We've got some criminals in this room. And then I <laughs> you know, kind of do the Barney Fife walk up to the front of the room and say, I've been running some license plates. When I call your name, come up here and get your ticket. <laughs> so I call two or three people up and, if the event planner is doing their side of the job, they give me people that are, as soon as they say their name, the crowd's like, oh, they got Jim up there. Oh, they yeah, got Betsy. Yeah. You must have to make sure you get people who are well-liked, right? I or I suppose so. you could go to the opposite way. <laughs> be like, oh, yeah, okay, like give it to them. <laughs> yeah, you but could. Yeah, you probably there are some variables in there to consider for yes, sure. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and so I'll actually, to get the three or four names, I'll have them give me eight or nine. Right, right. So I'll kind of whittle it down. And, um, and we can give them a ticket for, you know, depending on their sense of humor, we can praise them yeah. and say, oh, I've got you for a, for a fraudulent time card punching. <laughs> you, know, you, you said 40 hours, but we know you worked 80 hours last week trying to get the body right. done on time. Right, right, right. Or we can kind of give them a little jab if they're good nature. Go, I got you for being for the first person out of the parking lot every Friday at 359 or whatever. <laughs> okay, good. But what works really good is if if everybody in the audience knows something about that person, like they're an overtop right. sports fan or, right. you know, whatever everybody knows, we can have fun with that. Yeah, it doesn't come in the next morning after a fill-in-the-blank game. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Okay, that's really good. And so I do that, then I dismiss those people back. I walk up to the podium with Barney Fife and basically reintroduce myself. Like, okay, now we're going to get our speaker in here now that the room is safe. Put your hands together for Rick Roberts. And then I'll yeah. duck down behind the podium, take off my hat and pop back up. And, Thanks, Barney. You know, <laughs> so it's a That's big good. opening. The energy is good. The endorphins are kicking in and they're ready to receive the message, which is the right. key part. Right. And then I end the program as Barney Fife uh, with the, with the, it's a five minute joke that ties in everything I've talked about during the keynote into that story. And so they can, if they want to get pictures with me on the way out as Barney Fife, they can do that. But it, it starts and ends with a bang and there's plenty of fun in the middle. That's awesome. Now we haven't really talked about kind of mining your stories. So let's say the story that you're talking about that kind of ties everything into a nice neat bow at the end of your talk. Um, what kind of a story would you use for that? And then how would you then go backwards and mine that story for humor? Sure. One of the, the great gifts of, having done comedy for 10 years is building up a lots of material. And so if you're a speaker and you're just trying to get into comedy, we'll have to develop that, you know, kind of from now on to start tapping into it. But when I started speaking, I looked back at my comedy and said, is there anything, is there a subtext to these jokes? So I, I have one bit where I, I'm talking to my wife and she says something to the effect of, you know, I want you to communicate more, but I don't want you to talk. <laughs> And then there's a whole big story that happens after that. But when I was looking at my pro, you know, putting jokes in my program, like this whole thing is about communication. This, even though we're, you know, we're not talking about marriage in the keynote, but we're talking about misunderstandings and not communicating ideas effectively. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make sure I took that story and anchored my takeaway with humor directly talking about communication, right? I have a section about eliminating distractions. So I talk about my kids and texting and all this kind of stuff. Right. And then um, I've got one section about serving your clients and looking for, looking for ways to serve them when they're least expected. Because when they connect with you on that level, that's when they become an ambassador for your brand and tell people what you did for them. Right, like, right. So those are my main three points in that Mayberry program. And then the story I tell is about driving across Kansas. And I was distracted and didn't realize that the highway patrol drove Mustangs, Trans Ams, and Camaros. Right, right. So I see this guy speeding. I'm like, I'm going to get right behind that guy. He's probably got a radar detector. <laughs> right? And so then I, I talked for a couple seconds about needing to pay attention so you're not distracted because you can get caught up in something that you don't know what it is. Right? right. So then I decide I should pull that guy over because he started swerving across the road. And I thought I could help him by pulling him over. When I pull him over, I see he's a police officer. He starts to crack the window and, and it's like, uh oh, I've got zero game plan now. Right. Yeah. So then I talk about thinking on the fly and how you can try to salvage a situation that's gone wrong, which is part of the program. Right. And then the, the last little bit of it is the, the 
police officer looks at me and looks at my ID and he says, you're out here being a comedian. I said, yeah, I'm a comedian. He goes, well, I don't recognize you. You must not be a very good comedian. You ever been on Letterman or Leno or something like that? And then, so as a self deprecating way to wrap it up, I'm like, nah, you ever been on cops? (laughs) So that's good. But it ties in the points, you know, and it, it, right. it really reinforces the three. And then I step out of that story and say, so I hope you remember today, you know, resolve conflict, turn negative situations into positive ones and focus on people. So they remember the story. And if they remember the story, they'll remember the takeaways. Beautiful. And there's nothing better in comedy like a good of a good callback, would you say? Yeah. And people don't know what a callback is. It's referencing a joke that worked earlier or a situation mm-hmm. later in your show. And, and the reason comedians love it is, you know, the structure of a joke is a setup, punchline, and taglines. When you do a callback, you've already done the setup 10 or 15 minutes or 30 minutes ago, so you're getting a laugh without any downtime. Right. You know what I'm saying? And to be honest, most of the callbacks I have in my show came from other comedians that were watching my show and go, oh, man, you should say this there, because I'm kind of too close to it. Right. So when, and I know as uh, speakers, if you're part of the NSA, you have a, a chance to be part of eSpeakers.com, which mm-hmm. it'll show you when you're in an area with another speaker. Right. And you, and you can search the database and see who speakers, what speakers live in that town you're going to. Always try to find a chance to bring somebody into your program to just say, hey, listen, I'm looking for feedback. I'll pay for your dinner or whatever, and I'll do the same thing for you at some point. Yeah. But. I'm so close to my program, I probably can't see blind spots and opportunities. Beautiful. And when you do that for others, you'll, you'll definitely find some things you can use. That's nice. And, and this is a really nice segue to talk about your school of laughs, don't you think? Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So here in Nashville, I started a thing called School of Laughs. And it was about 2000, about year 2001 or two when I moved to Nashville, the comedy club they had an open mic and the guy who ran the comedy club saw me and said, Oh man, could you help us with our comics? Cause people are walking out during the open mics it, and an open mic is usually somebody's first time or it's people right. trying out new jokes. He goes, they don't even know the basics of how to take the microphone out of the stand or how to establish a connection. He goes, can you teach people how to be funny? Yeah. And to be honest, I said, I said, no man, you either got it or you don't. And he goes, well, how did you get it before you became a comedian? I'm like, ah, I'm not sure, but I got it now. I wasn't a comedian when I was in high school or junior high or Hmm. whatever. He said, what I want you to do is watch your show, pause it every time you get a laugh, rewind it, and figure out what made the audience laugh. Yeah. And when I did that, it it completely changed not only my shows, but the way I approached writing comedy up front. Because now I knew why they were laughing. Before, I'd be honest, I would just, if if they laughed, I would do it again. You were kind of winging it. I would throw it against the wall. If it stuck, I would use it again. Mm-hmm. And, but I didn't realize the stuff that didn't stick just didn't have a clear setup, a clear premise, or a good punchline, or mm-hmm. I wasn't using any techniques. There's about how oh, close to 20 techniques that I use during a, a typical comedy show. And so the School of Laughs, I started to teach comics and speakers those techniques, how to write jokes to use those techniques, how to look at current events, mind your personal stories, your experiences, and take all those things and make them funnier. So there's multiple ways that I can help people with that. One, I have a podcast called School of Laughs. You can find it anywhere you download podcasts. And if you're a speaker, you might want to go back and listen to the one I did with Jeannie Robertson Mm. or Karen Eddington. Uh, I've got one coming up with Brad Montgomery, Jess Pettit, Damian Mason. Some of my favorite people. Very nice. They're all great people, and they're all givers, right? So you can listen to their episodes, pick up some tips from that. If you want to go deeper, I have online course materials that are available. Uh, You can take a a course and learn all the techniques. You can do that self-paced. You can do it where I give you feedback, or you can do the third level where I give you feedback and we conference call and watch videos together. Very good. That's great. Uh, So everybody go to schooloflaughs.com. We'll put that in the show notes. And definitely – Definitely check out that podcast. That sounds fantastic. I'm going to check that out myself. And you know what? I'll, I'll put together a, a page on my website just for people that listen to your podcast. Okay. That are speakers. And I'll have links to all, all those podcasts I just mentioned and some free downloads. They, they can go to rickroberts.com forward slash speaker tips. Okay. And I'll put that all up on there. And Rick Roberts is R-I-K 
roberts.com. We'll, we'll make sure we get that right in the show notes as well. Well, Rick Roberts, thank you so much for your time today and this wealth of information that you've shared with us uh, on how to add a little bit or maybe a lot more humor into her presentations. Appreciate your you're, time. You're absolutely welcome. Thanks. It was a lot of fun. And for those of you who are uh, looking for more on this, check out Rick's uh, podcast, schooloflaughs.com. Also, be sure to come on back to uh, speakerlauncher.com and click on our podcast and see topics that you may have missed in the past. With that, we will say thanks so much for listening, everyone, and we'll see you soon, wealthy speakers. Bye for now. Hey, thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed our show, you'll want to come and visit us at the Wealthy Speaker School, where we provide a proven roadmap for building your dream business. Go to WealthySpeakerSchool.com. And for show notes for today's podcast, head on over to SpeakerLauncher.com and click on podcast. I'll see you soon, Wealthy Speakers.